Good evening, Motor Rider World fans, and welcome to another very special live broadcast that we got for you here on our Facebook page, where we're going to chat to one of SA's finest uh, ever motorcycle racers, uh, Stephen Oerendahl from World Supersport. Of course, his first season in the World Supersport category. We're going to catch up with him and see how his year went, and of course, maybe get uh, some price, some information out of him uh, concerning 2021. So that's going to be really interesting to hear what he has to say about that. Uh, just before we get into Stephen Undahl, remember that the first print issue of Motor Rider World is available. So if you'd like to subscribe, you can just email me, rob at motorriderworld.com, and we'll get you signed up for a nice year subscription. Gets courier to your door. I know all the, the guys that have already subscribed, they've already most of them have already received their first issue of Motor Rider World. Otherwise, we will have available and on sale at uh, Red, Red Star Raceway over the coming weeks. We'll have a Kalami track days on the 28th. Of November, and we'll have at Ridgeway Race Bar tomorrow for MotoGP and uh, the final MotoGP race uh, on that Sunday as well. So, email me, get signed up, and get the first ever print issue of Motor Rider World. Um, hello, Mark Freeman, Keith Buerta, Luca Jefferson, Wayne Fisher, Bronwyn Holmes. Uh, it's not it's not good morning, Mark Freeman. It's good evening at six o'clock. Okay, but it might be a little bit earlier where Stephen Undal is. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Stephen Undal live from the Czech Republic. Stephen, how's it going, man? How's it, Rob? And welcome to everyone that's on the live feed. How are you doing? Yeah, well, good. Good and you, man. So why exactly are you in the Czech Republic? Well, yeah, like uh, I said a little bit earlier, I, I do have a wife to keep in my life, and uh, <laughs> yeah, she lives here now. So basically, yeah, to spend some time with the wife and uh, yeah, enjoy some off season. Yeah, and I also think it's it's pretty good to be this side in Europe uh, for any uh, winter testing or things like that coming up. Nice, yeah, not a bad place to be, the Czech Republic, and don't forget, happy wife, happy life. I live my, that's my life motto, happy happy wife, happy life. <laughs> I agree with you, Andrew. Uh, Stephen, your first season in, in World Supersport, um, Carl Skuman joins us, her son uh, Khan joins us, Bronwyn Holmes, Cindy Bond, Gareth O'Barley, Steve Coy. Guys and girls, if you have any questions, post them there. I'll try and uh, have a look down the sidebar as all those comments come in. We can try and ask Stephen, but obviously Stephen, Talk us through quickly the highlights and the lowlights of your, your first season in World Supersport. You you were very consistent, finished fifth overall in the World Championship, I think. Um, but there, there were definitely some highs and lows. You know, there were times where you were really on it and, and challenging up there. And there were times where there was just something missing, missing. So, you know, tell us about your first season in World Supersport. Yeah, well, it was uh, quite a difficult year for me to be, to be truly honest because... Um, we, we lacked a lot of information, data. Um, everyone was getting to the tracks from the year before and they would arrive and know exactly what gearing, what setup they were using from the previous years, uh, engine braking and all of this stuff. But uh, as we arrived to these tracks, we are starting um, on the back foot because obviously without uh, data, you see how important it is uh, in the GP uh, important thoughts is and obviously this was one of the biggest issues that we had and um, yeah as you could see like a lot of races the first race would be terrible and then the second race all of a sudden I'd have the pace because we'd obviously find um, some big problems that we were incurring uh, with in the first race and obviously luckily enough had a chance to prove ourselves in the second one but um, like you said a bit of an up and down season uh, I did. Um, I did really enjoy being in the super sports uh, paddock. Uh, I did enjoy the the atmosphere there. A lot more chilled. Obviously, the GPs um, a different uh, caliber, but uh, I'm really happy to be there. I mean, doing what I love and being being happy is awesome, you know. So I really think that for for my future, um, being in an environment we enjoy, it's perfect, you know. And like I said, with the team, uh, we, we learned quite a lot this, this first year. And I'm really looking forward to going back there next year to, to show what I really have in store. No, so you've given a little information away there about next year, but we'll get into that just now. A question here from JD Kutsia. Please ask Stephen, how does he manage all those breathtaking 
world-class saves. You seem to have become very famous for these, like, Randy Mamola saving these massive high sides. <laughs> do you cock yourself? Do you have to change your undies? Do you pack extra undies? Or is it just luck of the draw? Yeah, I mean, it's happened to me quite a few times now. So I'm getting quite used to it. But I mean, I think it's just a, a matter of reaction. And yeah, but it is quite a scary moment because all of these uh, these moments have been complete grip and then complete loss of traction. So it's been pretty scary, but uh, luckily my reactions have been quick enough to save them. I saw quite a few crashes there in that corner in Estoril in the last corner and it people didn't come out looking so good afterwards so good to save them and yeah i think a set of underwear change was necessary <laughs> uh ronaldo Poulton says yeah your last race was probably your best race and i have to agree i was watching you there and it looked like you just stepped up your pace and like you said the team had found something but take us through quickly how different was it from the moto 2 paddock or not not even the paddock from setting up and racing a moto 2 bike on dunlops compared to a World Supersport uh, 600 where now you're on Pirelli Slicks this year. Uh, the Supersport bikes, the R6, you're not allowed running the auto blip. I don't know, you, you don't have traction control, all that. How was the difference and that transformation from the two? Is it a lot easier to set up a World Supersport bike compared to a Moto2? Well, initially I thought, yeah, wow, you know, going to the Supersport paddock, you don't really have that many changes. I mean, you can't change your pivot, you can't change your rake angle. Uh, these type of things you can't really change. So I was expecting to adapt a lot quicker. But obviously okay. when you've got less less things to change, it's also coming down to finer details on the things that you can change. So you guys have literally in the front of that field have got everything dialed in so nicely that they're just literally on the edge every single corner, every single lap, which is what you need. You know, you need to have that bar. 100% confidence going into a corner knowing that you can uh, break as late as possible and that front's not going to tuck away from you. Um, so, look, the Moto 2, for sure, you have more options, but I think when you realize in the Moto 2 not to change the whole bar all the way around, you can be very competitive. But um, in the super sports, I mean, you really need to find that that golden golden setting. And, and especially with the en engine braking, I mean, we were battling so so much this year with the engine braking. It was ridiculous. Um, yeah, uh, I can't go into detail because it's very complicated. But um, we were really battling with that this year. But what? But what do you mean with it? Was there too much? Too little? Was it not stopping enough? Was it freewheeling? Yeah, I mean, transition from holding the brakes to touching the accelerator. There wasn't enough. Um, let's call it clearance and it was going from a two cylinder cut in the middle of the corner to out of a engine cut at all and then back into a cylinder cut which obviously messes up and makes you run wide and and the problem was the threshold wasn't set high enough a few little mistakes like this just really upset um upset us and also in the rain conditions in france we had a, a lot of problems with rear locking up during the race and obviously, when you when you lock the rear up, it's just like you can't stop the bike. It's just like you on us. So uh, we just we had a lot of niggles and wiggles this year, but uh, um, yeah, looking forward to coming back next year and, and putting that to the dust. So you had, a, you, had, you had quite a few really good rides this year. What do you, what race meeting would you look at? Like I think at Aragon and even the last race at Estoril, where you think. I, I could have got a podium out of it. Like, which races did you think, you know, I did well, but there was maybe a little bit more that I, that I could have been on that podium? Yeah, I believe that uh, Portugal race two, I could have been on the podium. I believe Barcelona race two. Barcelona race two is actually an incredible race for me because the first four laps, I had no breaks going into the last three corners. Um, not due to the team's fault, but because of the rain the day before, we had some uh, problem with the brakes and overheating. And um, I had no brakes in the last three corners. So I was just about to pull in on the first lap because what do you want to do without brakes? You know, it's dangerous for other riders as well as yourself. And then when I went down the front, the main straight, I realized, okay, I've got brakes again. 
and I try to learn where the brakes, where the brake issues were. But mm -hmm. towards the end of the race, my pace was uh, just as fast as the front front three, and I believe if I didn't have this issue, I could have 100% been on the podium. And then again in Portugal race two, I had a huge moment high side and uh, lost quite a lot of contact, but coming back to fourth position, uh, one second from third was possible for podium position there. Yeah, that was definitely one of the best ones. Um, I mean, overall, it, like I said, it was ups and downs, but so you finished fifth in the world championship, pretty much down to your consistency, good first year, learning some new tracks, adapting, like you said, with a, I mean, Tenkat has been around for a long time, but it was their first real comeback into Supersport 600 with the Yamaha. What, uh, what is a guy now that in, at fifth in the world championship, you know, back in the day, call it 10 years ago, that would guarantee you a proper ride for the following year. It's not really the case now. I mean, have you signed again or was it a battle to sign? Have you left the team? What is what is now happening for, for 2021? What can you tell us, basically? What are you allowed to tell us? Yeah, so basically I had three of, of, uh, offers on the table, three or four, um, but for sure we, we went with the best option. So I can confirm that I will be on the on the Super Sport Road in 2021. Um, I'll give you guys a little hint, but uh, I'm going to Italy tomorrow just for, for to meet up with the guys and team just to have a bit of a chat. And uh, yeah, so information will come out this following week coming to who I'm going to be signing with. And yeah, I'm quite excited for that. Yeah, I think that's going to be awesome. I think for, with what you've learned this year, uh, hopefully it's uh, on R6 machinery or potentially a Ducati 959 would be quite nice as well. A V2 now that they've been allowed, well, in, in British Supersport they've been allowed, but they're coming into World Supersport. But um, Steve, I've always kind of looked at you as more a better 1,000cc rider. I don't know, like I remember years back when I raced you at Kalami, you climbed on your dad's Ducati, the one race meeting at a national at Kalami. And I think you like qualified third or something. I think you crashed your brains out at West Bank. But you were so fast at such a young age on a super bike. If I look what you did last year coming back and racing in nationals on your R1, you were fast there. Were there any kind of thoughts about going into the super bike paddock? Yeah, well, initially that was my thought process. I mean, obviously the, the opportunities in the super sport uh, were much better than, I mean, I didn't really have any offers in the thousands, but the, the plan was to try um, stick with the same team, try win the championship for Tenkata this following year and um, then move on to the super bikes because I also was pushing them to let me just try out uh, Baz's thousand or one so they could see how quick I really could be. I'm, I also agree with you. I think I would be a lot faster. Well, I know I am a faster superbike rider than 600 rider. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it's just like I have to do my penance uh, in this category to make sure that I get onto a proper ride when I do eventually go to the World Superbikes. Yeah, I think I think World Superbikes would be a, a proper category for you. I just I think you are more suited to that, you know, get it in, break late, get the bike stopped and not, not scared to hammer it out. I think that's your riding style. With with your Moto2 connections that you've had, we've seen in the last couple of weeks, Moto2 riders falling by the wayside and spots opening up. In the last couple of weeks, has there been these kind of offers that, you know, someone with experience on Dunlop tires on a Moto2 bike, have you had some wild card options? To be honest, I've completely disconnected from the, the MotoGP paddock as I believe that my focus now has shifted completely to the Superbike side. I mean, that's my next goal. I want to be in World Superbikes, um, fighting up there with the front guys. And that's where I've now set my targets for. Um, many people might think like, wow, you know, letting go of a dream of MotoGP. But for me, I've just uh, faced reality and I believe that I can make myself a, a really good career in the Superbox and I'm not going to go push for one off wild card ride uh, in the Moto2 where practically, if you know the game, it doesn't re really mean much because the opportunities to sign for the following year in Moto2 um, are quite difficult. So to go, uh, sure, if someone calls me in, I mean, I would have to discuss it with my my team that I'm signing with, but 
I mean, at the moment, I'm not really interested in, in that anymore. I think, you know, I think I also make the mistake sometimes of overlooking World Superbikes. And, you know, I was at that final race at Estoril, and it was just kind of a reminder to me that the, that World Superbike paddock is is a proper good paddock. Yeah, it's not as like glitzy and glamoury as Moto Moto GP, but the equipment in there, the, the talent, the speed. I mean, I would, when when you track when you stand trackside and watch you super sport guys and those World Super guy, Superbike guys in action, I mean, those guys are stupid fast. You know, take nothing away from them. That that paddock deserves a lot more respect than it actually probably gets. And I think Garrett Gerloff going and doing FP1 and FP2 last weekend in Valencia kind of showed that, you know, the World Superbikes guys aren't as bad as, you know, the rest of the world thinks. And that you go and you be competitive in the World Superbike paddock, you, you're not hanging around. Yeah, I think it, it works like that with uh, most uh, professional categories. I mean, uh, not everyone's just going to come in there and, and win, you know. So, like like you see with Gerloff going to the, the MotoGP, I mean, that's just absolutely ridiculous. Never been on a MotoGP bike, never used carbon brakes and been able to do what he did there. Yeah, sure. Um, you weren't really on that much, that hard of pace. But I mean, also give the guy two or three weekends. And yeah, I mean, it just shows you that these oaks are really fast. And uh, like you say, it's a little bit undermined in Superbike. Well, what do you think of this potential new new rule that Dorna are bringing in, letting the Ducati V2 and the Triumph Moto2 bike race in World Supersport? Uh, I mean, it's it's a championship pretty much dominated by by Yamaha, but at the same time, you can't penalise Yamaha for that that they brought out a really good, you know, 600 Supersport bike. So, I mean, what do you think? What do you think of that? Do you think it would be good seeing more manufacturers? Oh, yeah, I, w I think it would be awesome to see more manufacturers. I mean, you've got the likes of Yamaha and Vio Augusta is really, really fast. Um, I mean, I'm sure there'd be a lot of uh, guys' dreams to ride a Ducati 600 again. That would be awesome. Um, I actually heard Krumanaka was testing testing the Ducati, and uh, that would, would be quite nice. So I think, it, I mean, the more manufacturers allowed in, the better because it just makes the class that much better. And I think next year is going to be super competitive because a lot of people are coming, some people from Moto2, some, uh, some other X riders that were in the championship are coming back and it's going to be a, a really a good class to watch. Yeah, I think so. I think World Super Sport is kind of putting itself back on the map. The racing this year was quite good other than Locatelli. But the last couple of races, you guys kind of reeled him in and it, it got a lot closer. What was the biggest in terms of your riding style that you had to change from Moto to to World Supersport? Like those first couple of races in World Supersport, were you watching the guys in front of you and watching how they they were riding and saying, right, uh, you know, the Moto Two bike with the Dunlop tires, I had to stand the bike up more. Or what was the biggest personal riding change that you had to make to to be fast on a on a Supersport bike compared to Moto Two? Yeah, well, that's where I was actually lacking a little bit this year. Is that Normally, when I when I'm training in South Africa um, on my R6, when I whack in a new tire, uh, or I put in a new tire, I really feel the real benefit of that grip. And it seems like everyone else around me did as well. But for some unknown reason, I don't know, I set up or or what happened. But normally, the first three laps, I felt like I was on glass. Well, not glass, but it really didn't didn't feel good. You know, that's why I always had all these moments this year. The high, big high sides and a couple of them weren't caught in from camera and uh, I pulled some big saves this year and I mean I just think it's about having the whole bike working as one with you and that's obviously uh, pushing to the maximum I mean I think the biggest difference between the Moto2 and the Super Sport is if you're having a bad day maybe you're in 14th or something mm -hmm. whereas in the Moto2 you, you're out right at that Okay, so now for 2021, you're back in World Super Sports with this team that you're going to announce soon. So everyone, look, keep a look out on Steve and Wendell's Facebook page, Motor Rider World page. We'll announce that. Realistically, I mean, do you, do you feel like you are now mentally, physically, you know, adapted to the, the, the bike, the tires and the tracks 
you think top three going for the, the world championship is now a, a serious option because like you said there's a lot of fast riders returning from world superbikes and coming from moto two but you know you were kind of there or thereabouts this year so i mean you think you've got that next level to now go to every race meeting thinking right we've got this yeah, so I believe that uh, the decision with the team is going to make a huge difference as well as um, the bike I'll be on next year. I think that we really can honestly fight for the win. And uh, I, I really, well, I enjoyed this year that I could feel and figure out where I was and uh, now next year I come back with a big bang. Good man, that's what we like to hear. Steve, before we let you go, quickly, what did you think about uh, Mr. Dive Bomb Darren today putting it on pole for the first time? Yeah, I'm so proud of him. I mean, yes, it was awesome, man. Just I was watching the practice, the qualifying, and I was just like, I knew, I knew he was perfectly positioned, and he just managed to smash it straight onto par. I was so proud of him. And also with uh, Brad, that was also another great performance. I mean, you could clearly see that he didn't have another tire to put in there uh where i think he could have probably fought for the for the top three for sure but that's good because you could see how much pace he's got for tomorrow's race so i think it's going to be really really good yeah I, I think, I think... i'm gonna have to be on top in super sport uh darren in moto 3 next year and brad in moto gp that would be good for south africa yeah. dude that that would yeah, you've said it, and eh? you've set the bar. So don't go letting us down. Uh, last question before I let you go: If if you were to go World Superbike right now, and you were offered any one of the teams and bikes in that paddock, I mean, what what do you think? I mean, Johnny Ray is winning on the Kawasaki. Yes, I don't necessarily think it's the, the best package. I think, you know, I, I actually wrote the story that I went with shares to that last Estoril race on the Kawasaki in World Superbikes, and it's very much a case of. Mark Marquez and Honda in MotoGP where Marquez makes the Honda look like it's the best bike because he wins on it. But it's a bike yeah. that's adapted to him. And I, and I watched Johnny Ray out on track compared to the other Kawasaki riders. And he rides it completely different. And even Shez was saying, you know, comparing his data with Ray, he, he couldn't ride the bike the way Ray was. So if you could have the choice tomorrow, cool. Stephen, choose whichever World Superbike you'd like to be on. Which, which bike would you go for? Sure, that's a that's a tough one, but uh, like you said, I think that Johnny Ray's definitely perfected that Kawasaki. You know, I mean, you see the way that guy picks up the bike out of the corners; it's just ridiculous. I mean, insane. Like, uh, but yeah, if if I had to choose tomorrow, I'd have loved to be on a Yamaha or a Ducati. I think those are the two two machines at the moment. I mean, the Yamaha. They're all very, very competitive. Maybe not as quick as the winning box, but you can definitely bag yourself a couple of wins and podiums on that. Uh, good man, uh, Stephen. Well, you've got so many fans. There. You've got Cindy Bond, Stephen Berry, Paul Woodward, Shane Uren, Grant Johnson, Brian Ritchie, Gareth Barley. Just everyone wishing, wishing you good luck. Uh, we'll keep a lookout for your news that will be coming soon to to tell us where which team you'll be in. Glad to hear that you're back on the grid. I think you deserve to be there, finishing top five in the World Championship. And yeah, let's 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 go for that number one plate next year because I think you certainly have got the talent. We know that just needs to come together, and then hopefully World Superbikes 2022 on a factory Yamaha R1. Yeah, perfect. I think uh, you should write the scripts for me, Rob. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time out. Go back to your beautiful wife in Czech Republic. Go run a nice bath. Put some rose petals in there, and um, yeah, maybe bring us some baby Stevens. That would be nice. <laughs> I think we'll be watching <laughs> the, the qualifying together before that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good man, Stephen. Thank you so much for taking out the time, man, and, and all the best. And we'll chat to you early next year, maybe after some testing, and then we'll catch up and see how it's all going. Okay, Laka. Thanks for everyone that's joining. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Take it easy, bud. Cheers. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Email robert motorriderworld.com. Get yourself subscribed to the greatest magazine in the entire world. Until next time, enjoy the racing next weekend. Look out for the news from Stephen Undal and ride safe. Keep well. Cheers, guys. Cheers.